than a wicked and hip hop. Bad, bad, and a wicked and It's a beautiful weather outside here today, right, by the way. So uh, hopefully uh, we can get through the condom soon and you can enjoy the weather outside. Yeah. All right. Uh, the similar administrative stuff, uh, the homework five is, uh, I mean, actually it already released, right, on Monday and it's already due, it's, it's going to be due on uh, December the 2nd. And then uh, project four, I mean, uh, actually I forgot to update that slide today, but uh, again, uh, project four is also already, well, project Homework 5 has not, has not been released yet, but Project 4 has already been released, right? And it will be due on December the 5th. So hopefully, uh, similar to the other projects, hopefully everyone can, can uh, start Project 4 sooner, right? Because right now, already uh, there are more people have used up all their uh, grace days. So uh, yeah, it's better to uh, start Project 4 a little bit early and find, find out issues earlier. So uh, for the upcoming database talk on um, next Monday, we'll have uh, this uh, company called uh, Dreamio. It's actually a uh, analytical engine built on this uh, open source um, data format called Apache Arrow, like it's a columnar format. So they're going to come here and how, how, talk about how do they uh, do their query optimization and then how do they accelerate uh, data analytics uh, with this um, open source columnar data format. Right? So if you're interested, you could check it out. So uh, for last class, we have been talking about this uh, basic concept of a distributed database system, right? So essentially, we talk about that uh, in a distributed database system, there are first a few design choices that you could choose for the architecture, right? And for the uh, single node database system that we talked about uh, in the earlier this semester, that would be called a uh, shared everything architecture, right? Essentially, all the uh, memory, all the uh, processors, as well as all the disks will be on a single node. But then in the distributed environment, there could be different choices, right? The first would be shared memory. Essentially, all the processors would access a, a single unified interface that combine different memory chips um, potentially located on different machines, right? For example, one way to do this would be using an RDMA, and then the processors could access the same address space. The second choice, uh, and the third choice, would be the uh, more common approaches. The second choice would be uh, called shared disk, which essentially uh, means that uh, all the disks right, would combine to have a single uh, interface, and then uh, all the uh, distributed machines, they would have uh, their own uh, CPUs as well as own memory, but then once they want to read, it, read the data, they actually go into this uh, central location that would uh, orchestrate all the uh, data management, either on a single physical machine or on different machines. An uh, example of this would be Amazon S3. And then this is actually a more common approach in many of the uh, recent cloud-based database systems. And the last one would be a shared nothing, also very common, but more common in the database system or the distributed database system uh, before 2010. Uh, essentially, uh, every uh, node in the distributed database system would have its own memory, uh, CPU, as well as disk, but it's only going to be responsible for one portion of the data. And then there's a higher level, a network layer, that would communicate the uh, data, data management between different nodes for different partitions of the data. Right. Then we'll talk about a different partitioning scheme of those uh, data in a distributed database system. And usually people either use hash partitioning or range partitioning, and also you can naively uh, just distribute data in a round-robin fashion, right? but that, that will be less common. And lastly, we touched a little bit on the notion of uh, transaction coordination. Essentially, you could have either a centralized coordinator or a decentralized coordinator. Right? So uh, today, we are going to uh, go into more details about this uh, transaction in a distributed database system. All right. So uh, first, I want to uh, make a distinction between a uh, very two commonly used uh, concepts or types of workloads uh, in database uh, scenario, right? So essentially, in database world, right, when people talk about database uh, workloads, usually people, uh, well, roughly speaking, right, there are different types, many different types of workloads, but there are two very common types of workloads. One is called uh, online transaction processing. The other would be called online analytical processing. Okay, so the first transaction, or in abbreviation OLTP, would actually refer to uh, these short-lived and read and write operations that actually, uh, again, they are, they are short-lived, so they uh, typically don't last long, and then they often have a repetitive logic. So a, a very typical example of this would be uh, online shopping, right? for example. When you open up your Amazon account, try to put something in your shopping cart, and then try to buy this stuff, that most of those uh, operations or transactions would be classified as 
online transaction processing because most of the time right you are just only uh, touching let's say your card may have 10 20 items right and then uh, you bought these items you deduct them from the inventory of Amazon, and then uh, somehow later on you put that into your uh, order history, right? And then the, the products will be shipped to you. And oftentimes, when I say these are really have this just transactions, you really have a repetitive op a logic or operation. That's because you don't actually go to write the SQL queries to uh, deduct some items from the Amazon inventory and then put that in your order history, etc. Right? Usually, for this kind of uh, online transaction workload the logic or the uh, template of the transaction, right, the core logic of the transaction, would actually uh, directly uh, baked in or developed by the application. Right? In this case, it would be Amazon. They actually have, would have a template of these different transactions uh, to buy things on their, on their website. And then when you want to buy a few specific items, you would actually just replace these parameters in this template of the transaction. You know, in other words, this core logic of the transaction replace those parameters with your own specific products and then execute this transaction, right? So, but usually there will be a template that's used over and over again in that scenario. And on the other hand, the other common scenario would be uh, online analytical processing. And usually these are actually uh, pretty uh, long running, but read only uh, queries or transactions. And usually they could perform some uh, complicated, complicated uh, analytical logics, as well as uh, usually these are ad hoc queries or exploratory queries that there may not be a predetermined template or logic of those uh, queries, right? So a simple example of online analytical processing would be, again, taking the Amazon example, right? Say uh, uh, the, the day has passed, uh, then there are lots of transactions, and then someone from Amazon, right, could be a data analytics, come along and want to figure out, hey, what would be the um, average sale of a particular product, product in the region of North America over the last month, right? then this type of queries would be considered analytical query, and then uh, they uh, typically would read lots of lots of rows, right? Maybe in this case would be all the sales of this product over the last month. Uh, and then uh, they could perform some complex logic, try to figure out, hey, what would be the exact value that you want to evaluate? And again, these queries, when I say exploratory, which means that Often, oftentimes, there's no predefined core logic to execute a set of queries one by one. Right? Sometimes, now you may want to look at uh, what would be the average sale of uh, the, over the last month, but then after you get that value, you may have some new ideas, right? You may be curious about, hey, what would be the sales of the two months ago, right? And do the, some comparison and explore other things. So oftentimes, uh, there's no predefined logic, and then these queries are often uh, exploratory and long-running. But most of the time, these are read-only queries that perform analytics on the existing data set. So uh, today, we're going to focus on the uh, OLTP scenario with uh, read and writes, and potentially distributed on different machines. And for the next class, right next Monday, we're going to uh, look at the OLAP scenario. All right, make sense? Cool. So uh, come back to the uh, earlier example I discussed uh, last class about uh, coordination of uh, distributed transactions. I want to use that as a uh, motivating point or starting point to illustrate this concept. So uh, assuming here, again, we are assuming a decentralized scenario, which means that uh, every uh, node, I mean, in the partitions, in the set of partitions of my distributed database could actually uh, be responsible uh, to commit a transaction, right? So say here, uh, when the application server sends a request to uh, begin a transaction, it will land on one particular node. Right? Let's say this node is the primary node that's responsible for committing this transaction. <laughs> and then this query may, uh, or sorry, this uh, transaction initiated by this application server may send a different request, and that may span on uh, different partitions, right? And then after that, when the application server send a commit request, then this primary node is going to be responsible uh, for coordinating with these other nodes that participated in this transaction, right? To figure out, hey, whether this uh, transaction is safe to commit, if so, um, come back to the client, write log records, or if not, abort the transaction, et cetera, right? So uh, for today's lecture, we're actually going to focus on this, uh, this logic or, or this question mark here about how uh, this transaction or the distributed database is going to determine, hey, whether a distributed transaction is safe to commit or not, and if so, how does the system ensure that the transaction commit successfully committed on different partitions and eventually get back to the client, right? So I, I should say, unfortunately, I 
for today's lecture, right, for the scope of this lecture, we're not, do, not going to talk about uh, questions like, hey, how do the application server decide which node is a primary node, or what type of information or logs that I need to maintain on the primary node on the other participating partitions, et cetera, uh, just to, for, the, uh, for the sake of the, for the timing. But at a high level, right, I, I would say for, for all the concurrency control protocols we discussed earlier for single node database system, right, say the timestamp ordering, two-phase locking, or optimistic concurrency control, most of these protocols, right, the ideas, the algorithm, most of them would actually still apply in a distributed scenario. But of course, you need to do a little bit of tweak of them, extend, extend this algorithm so that you can communicate uh, the information, a different, uh, different lock, uh, lock lock states on different machines, right? You need to extend the algorithm a little bit, but then for the most part, those uh, concurrency control protocols would stay uh, similar, at least from a uh, intuitive level. But then the thing that we did not talk about, obviously, would be the, the last part I illustrated here, right? How do uh, a distributed transaction would actually commit when there are multiple participating uh, trans uh, partitions or nodes in a distributed system. And that's definitely, in a single node scenario, you just write a commit record in your log, and then you get, get back to the client, you are done, right? But in the distributed scenario, that's actually a little bit more complicated because there are multi nodes involved here, okay? So then that's what we are going to talk about today. So essentially, I mean, like, uh, like I said, we are going to talk about how do the database system know that this transaction is, is safe to commit, and then how do the system or the distributed system is going to ensure that a particular transaction, if safe to commit, is going to commit successfully. And then all the changes would be persistent and consistent. And especially, we are going to, we are going to focus on a few questions. For example, what if while you are trying to commit a transaction, some of the nodes fail, right? Because in a distributed scenario, nodes can have a failure. Or if the node didn't fail, but what if there's a delay of the message, right? For, for example, uh, there would be a network hiccup, right? And after a while, you still haven't received the message. How do you handle that situation? And the last one would be that, hey, if there are multiple nodes participating in this distributed transaction, do I have to wait for all the nodes to successfully uh, commit or to write records onto the disk and commit the changes before I get back to the client? If I do not want to wait for all the nodes to finish their operation, then how do, how do I still handle that transaction correctly, right? So these are all kinds of questions that we need to talk about when we uh, think about uh, the transaction commitment, transaction commits in a distributed system, all right? So that's what we're going to talk about uh, one by one in this class. So before I talk about the details, one important assumption, very important assumption that we need to uh, clarify here is that Typically, in a distributed database system, we assume that all the nodes that are participating in my distributed system would be uh, friendly or well-behaved, right? There will be uh, no nodes saying that uh, would lie to us, uh, to tell us that it successfully written some record onto the disk, but in actuality, it didn't, right? We assume there's no such of a malicious nodes exist. And that's kind of like uh, common, right? Because if you have your uh, own database system and that is that is managing all the all the nodes uh, uh, that the system that that the system has, then it's kind of assume that it's kind of like uh, 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 reasonable to assume that the system would control each of the node responsibly, right? Uh, reasonably. But then, in contrast, another scenario would be uh, considered a uh, or Bayesian failure scenario. Or you, you could say, hey, what if I'm going to assume that the nodes participating in my distributed system could behave uh, maliciously, right? So for example, uh, if one node uh, tell, tell me it has written a record onto the disk, or what if it doesn't do so, right? So that kind of scenario would be called a Bayesian -like, uh, scenario, and then the protocol or the algorithms to uh, uh, coordinate a distributed system in that scenario will be called a Byzantine uh, fault tolerant protocol, right? And one common, uh, well, probably well-known example of a Byzantine uh, tolerant, uh, Byzantine uh, fault tolerant protocol, which is essentially blockchain, right? Because in a public uh, blockchain, then you don't know who is managing which node participating in this uh, blockchain network, and then you sort of need a, a protocol that would be uh, uh, resilient to a yield behave the node. But that's not the focus today. Right? Today, we are assuming that the distributed database would have um, well control over all the nodes uh, that I mean, the system has, and then uh, would, would, that all the nodes would tell the uh, true information, honest information, 
uh, to the central system. All right, make sense? Okay, nice. So these are the specific topics we are going to talk about today. First, I mean, like I mentioned, we are going to talk about uh, the commit protocol, and then we are going to talk about uh, two concepts that I slightly mentioned in the last class, right? The first would be how do we do replications in distributed database, and second is that uh, how to deal with a uh, consistent issue, especially we are talking about this uh, cap theorem. And lastly, uh, we are talking about a, a concept that is not exactly related to uh, the uh, transaction commit, but it's also a, uh, a concept that is you will see in practice, right, called a federated database, all right? So uh, the uh, first topic, again, how do a uh, transaction commit in a distributed database? So there are actually uh, many algorithms uh, to do that. Uh, the first algorithm uh, of most uh, common algorithm actually, I should say, is called a two-phase commit, which is also an algorithm that we are going to focus on today. Uh, there are also uh, an extension of two-phase commit actually uh, invented by the, um, the uh, founder of PostgreSQL, right? essentially my advisor's advisor, called uh, Michael Stonebreaker. He invented this three-phase commit uh, algorithm, but it actually uh, turns out to be uh, too complicated and nobody actually uh, used it. And then there are also uh, other algorithms, I probably you also see them in your distributed system class uh, called Paxos or Raft. They are very, very similar, right? So, uh, minor differences. And then they can, they can also be used uh, to commit transactions in a distributed database. Uh, lastly, there are other um, less used algorithms. For example, Apache Zookeeper have this uh, algorithm called Zap, Zap. And then there's also a, a view time, a view stamp replication algorithm, right? But they are, uh, they are less often used in distributed database. So uh, today we are going to focus on these two, right? The first is the, uh, arguably, I think it's probably the most commonly used uh, algorithm called the two-phase commit, and then the other one is a pack source, right? Focusing on these two uh, protocols, okay? So uh, first, give you a illustration of a two-phase commit. So it's kind of uh, uh, straightforward, if you will. Essentially, it's kind of uh, already reflected uh, by the name of the protocol. There are two phases uh, in the uh, two-phase commit protocol, right? So uh, say uh, this uh, application has uh, finished all the operations that it wants to do with the transaction, and then it wants to uh, commit this transaction, right? And here, assuming that uh, this uh, node one is responsible uh, for coordinating, uh, this uh, commit, and then uh, in the terminology of two-phase commit, this node that coordinating everything would be called a coordinator, right? In, in my earlier example, earlier example showed in the class that it's called a primary node or something, but essentially uh, here is a similar meaning, right? But it's just in this terminology of two-phase commit, it's called coordinator. And then the other node, which is called a participant, and then what this uh, coordinator will do when uh, application server sends a commit request is that it's first going to go into the first phase, sending a prepare message to all the participants, right? To, to check about whether each of the participant is ready to commit. And if so, right, there's no problem of each participant to, to commit, then the, all the participants, participants will send this OK, res OK response back to this uh, coordinator, okay? And then this coordinator have to wait for all the participants to, to send this OK response back, and then on, only until then, it can start the second phase called commit phase, right? And then sending this commit request to all the participants. And then again, similar to the prepare phase, this uh, coordinator would actually need to wait for all the participants to get a response, like a, a, a OK message back from this uh, commit request saying that, hey, everyone has successfully committed this message, and then right now, I mean, after two phases has finished, uh, the coordinator can send back to the application and say that, hey, I have uh, successfully committed. All right, that's just kind of a little bit straightforward, right? Two phase uh, commit, just as the name suggests, the two phase, one prepare phase, one commit phase. Any questions? Okay, cool. So, uh, okay, uh, yeah, we will talk about this in detail later, but in the textbook, right, uh, in the textbook definition, during every step of this two phase commit, all the participants will actually uh, log out which phase it is and what message it sent out, right? Just uh, when you come back, you can see the log, and then, I mean, if, if there's a crash when you come back, you can also see the log, right? But it's not uh, that, uh, it's not really the focus today, but just uh, I mean, from the textbook, textbook algorithm, all the participants will also, also log out every stage uh, in this two phase commit as well. Yes, please. So, in the second, let's say the second phase starts. Yes. Right. And then those two practice. Yes. So then in that case, would those two have to recover and then realize they need to finish the commit and then do the commit? Okay, yeah, yeah. So essentially the, the question is uh, if 
let's say in here, right? When after the uh, coordinator sends the commit request to both nodes, and then one of nodes fail, what will happen, right? <laughs> so uh, we'll, it, we'll get there uh, in, in later in the class, but essentially there are different strategies, right? So in one scenario, uh, you can just uh, I mean, announce that the transaction has failed and then abort everything, but then there were other optimizations you could do to make the transaction continue, but then of course you have to do other things to deal with that after you come back. All right, a good question, yeah, thanks. All right, so uh, let's talk about a scenario of, just finish talk about the scenario of a transaction commit. Let's just quickly go over an example when a transaction abort, all right? <laughs> so here, say similarly, I right, see application server uh, send a commit request uh, to this node, and then similarly a node would, uh, I mean, the, the node would send this prepare request to different participant and see that the node three, right, this, this node is not ready to commit, right? For whatever reason, maybe, it detects that there's a conflict, right? There's some record that has, does not have the correct version. Again, unfortunately, we don't have time to talk about concurrency control specifically, but assume that node three cannot commit and then send an abort request. In this case, I mean, the transaction just would be aborted. And then, I mean, you just, uh, the, 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 this node one would actually come back and then send to uh, all the other participants. In this case, would be node two that, hey, I aborted and then please roll back all the changes. And then uh, this uh, transaction, um, after that, when uh, this um, dos two and three finishes all the, uh, I mean, rollbacks or undos, then it will send the okay response back to node one, all right? But then the thing to notice here is that once node one here realized that the transaction is going to abort, it can immediately send back to the client that right, has aborted, right? So for everything else, it only needs to happen afterwards. The client doesn't know, right? The system would guarantee that all the undo uh, happen correctly, similar to the case how we handle uh, a single node transaction. All right? Cool. Okay. So, uh, so this is actually a little bit related to, to, to the uh, earlier question the other student asked. <laughs> so uh, there are potential way to uh, optimize uh, this, uh, this like a basic two-phase uh, commit protocol. So the first is that obviously, as you, everyone has noticed, uh, during each phase, in, or at least in the basic protocol, the coordinator has to wait all the participants to send back the response, right? And then that waiting can potentially take quite some time, especially when you have some straggler. straggler. So the first <laughs> optimization that you potentially apply, can apply to two-phase commit, will be called early prepare voting. So the, the intuition of that is essentially that instead of um, sending a specific prepare request to all the participants uh, during the first phase, if somehow the coordinator can realize that, hey, this is the last query of the transaction already, right? This is already the last operation. And then after this uh, query, the transaction is going to either going to commit or somehow abort, then the coordinator can send this prepare request along with the last query of that transaction, right? And then if the participant receive uh, this combination of messages, and if it successfully uh, execute the last query, it can immediately validate whether it can uh, commit or not, right? And then directly send back this uh, response, this OK response for the commit phase alongside with the result of the um, last query. Uh, so this will actually say one round trip, right? That's one organization called early prepare voting. And of course, this assumes that the transaction or the coordinator would have the ability to know that this is the last query of that transaction, which may not always be true. But for some um, applications, for example, if you use the store procedure, it's actually, it's actually kind of common in, in many of the OLTP applications I talked about earlier, where you have a predefined logic, right? for a specific operation you need to do, for example, uh, check out this transaction on online, online shopping, then the logic of that transaction may be a template predefined, right? In that case, uh, maybe you can do the, you can know whether it's the last query of this transaction or not, and then do this early prepare OT, all right? That's the uh, first optimization. <laughs> the second optimization would be called early acknowledgement after pre prepare, right? So uh, essentially what this organization you could do is that if all the nodes already vote that uh, they, 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 are, they are going to commit this transaction, then right after the coordinator send uh, this, uh, this uh, commit request to the participants that the, it wants to commit, it actually already uh, send back to the client the acknowledgement that this transaction has successfully, successfully committed. Because at that time, the coordinator already know that 
all the participant is ready to commit, right? It's just a matter of whether the participant can finish, I mean, finish flushing the record and then make all the changes, et cetera, right? So at that time, core already know that this transaction can succeed and it can already tell the client that this uh, transaction has committed. This is called early acknowledgement after prepare. And of course, this would have uh, the additional overhead where um, if, the if the database system crash right away, then after you come back from the crash, you have to check the log, right? To see, hey, which phase are different participants of each transaction and whether there would be a participant that has already said it, it, it is prepared to commit, but actually didn't finish the commit and then you have to finish the commit process on the participant, right? Does that make sense? But then right, this gives you the advantage, advantage that you don't have to wait for the response for all the participants uh, to finish the second commit phase. Again, you can get back to the uh, clear client early and reduce the query latency. So to quickly illustrate the example of early acknowledgement. So say again, the application server sends the committee request and then the, this uh, coordinator can send first send this uh, prepare request to the participant. Participants, all the participants say that, hey, I'm okay to commit. And then uh, it's just a matter of, do I actually finish this commit or not? And then right now, when, I mean, before actually, I mean, at the meantime, when the node one is going to send the commit request, it can already tell the application server that, hey, this transaction has succeed, succeed. And then at the meantime, the uh, node one, this, sorry, this coordinator can send the commit request. And then we say uh, after some time, all the nodes have finished this commit and then it can send the uh, OK response. Then the coordinator know that, hey, all the operations of the transaction has finished, all right? It's like a simple illustration, okay? So a few uh, additional questions, right? A similar, I have, I have sort of mentioned this, right? So in the uh, textbook definition, uh, each node, or especially each participant, will actually uh, record the outcome of each phase in a uh, log record on the persistent storage device. That said, in actuality, uh, most people actually omit this step. Right, just uh, because it's not, uh, turns out to be not that useful, but the, the standard algorithm or the textbook uh, algorithm would actually require this, okay? And then uh, the next question is that what would happen, sorry, what happens if, a, uh, uh, if the coordinator uh, crashes, right, doing this uh, two-phase commit uh, protocol? Well, essentially the participant has to decide what to do, right? So uh, the, the most common way for the participant to deal with the, a crash of the coordinator would just be that it would set a timeout, uh, like time, right? If uh, the participant has sent some uh, response or OK response back to the uh, coordinator, but then haven't heard back uh, within this uh, timeout range, then it would just abort that transaction. Right? That's the com most common approach. Uh, alternatively, the the, all the participants can actually uh, decide to do a leader election and then promote a, a new uh, coordinator. But then if you choose to do that, you may just as well use a uh, leader election algorithm to begin with like Paxos and Raft, which I will get to in the very next slide. Uh, so most common way, the participant would actually just time out and abort. Next, <laughs> what if uh, the participants crash, right? So uh, again, so if a participant crash, then it will be the, uh, if it's, it's a coordinator that is waiting for the messages uh, to see uh, whether uh, the, it, it can get the OK response, right? So in this scenario, it actually depends. So if the uh, coordinator is still in the uh, prepare phase, right, in the first phase of this uh, two-phase commit protocol, then if it sends the prepare message and didn't hear back uh, the OK response from any of the uh, participant node, then the transaction has to abort, right? Because there's, there could be one node that is not ready to commit. Then, I mean, if the timeout has reached, then it has to abort. That said, if you use the early acknowledgement optimization that I talked about earlier, right? If you use that, then if the first phase has, success, successful fin has successfully finished, but then only at the second phase, when you try to commit, you, uh, this coordinator didn't hear back from a participant, then under the optimization of early acknowledgement, uh, then the transaction can still continue, right? Because at that time, in fact, you already tell your client that the transaction has finished. The only thing you need to do is that after you crash and then come back from the recovery, you have to check all the logs and the, the, all the status of both the coordinator as well as the participant to see that whether there's any transaction that has promised is ready to commit, but didn't finish the commit and then uh, redo the operation accordingly. 
All right, make sense? Nice, cool. So that's all about a two-phase commit, right? Kind of straightforward. So next, talk a little bit about uh, Paxos. <laughs> so uh, mm, essentially, one uh, I sort of mentioned this. One major uh, 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 um, issue or major uh, performance, potential performance bottleneck that could exist in two-phase commit is that at least during the first phase, right, during the uh, prepare phase, the coordinator has to wait for all the nodes. Uh, in the all the participants to send back the OK response, right, so that it can proceed. And then this is definitely a blocking operation. And then in some cases, if there's one, just only if there only if there, well, if there's only one straggler in all the participant node, then this uh, first phase, right, this prepare phase will actually take a very long time, right, because it then has to need, we need to wait for everyone to come back. Then a potential uh, alternative approach that could alleviate uh, this issue is uh, the algorithm called Paxos or Raft, right? Very, very similar. So essentially what this algorithm uh, or protocol allows you is that it will actually uh, allow this only a majority of the uh, participant, and in that case, uh, they have a different uh, name for them, but in, in two-phase commit terminology, it will be called participant, right? So Paxos would allow that if only a majority of the participant have tell you that, hey, I'm ready to commit, then you actually already, I mean, proceed and proceed your next step and then potentially commit this transaction. So if there's like a one or two straggler in, among all those participants, it doesn't, doesn't matter, right? you can still proceed. Of course, there comes with other overhead, I mean, other um, potential challenges you have to deal with to ensure that can uh, proceed correctly, right? And, and we are, we are getting into a little bit more details. But essentially, uh, it, it uh, allows this non-blocking operation, especially when they are scheduled uh, straggler. So the, uh, the, the very uh, first paper that proposed uh, this uh, Paxos algorithm was actually called a, uh, the, uh, the, the part-time parliament. Right? Essentially, it's a uh, paper written by the famous uh, Leslie Lamport. It's actually, <laughs> so, so many of you in your, distributed database, uh, sorry, in your distributed system class may have heard of uh, this paper, especially uh, uh, Leslie Lamport. So this uh, paper called Part-Time Parliament is actually not a conventional computer science paper. It's sort of kind of like a, a, a fictional story where uh, Lamport was actually describing a um, fake protocol that discovered in some uh, ancient Greek island where the tribe is uh, trying to uh, vote uh, to select their leader, uh, etc. Right, and then uh, these, uh, these, uh, the members of this tribe may reside on different islands um, in this ocean, so that it sort of needs a distributed uh, consensus protocol, right? So uh, this author kind of like uh, embed or like uh, describe this uh, particular protocol in this fictional story. And it actually turns out to be very, very difficult to understand and very confusing. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, if you are curious, you could check it out. It's kind of fun. But uh, yeah, I, it's, it's, if you read the original paper, it might not be easy to understand. Okay? <laughs> so let's uh, describe this uh, Paxos protocol. So uh, essentially, right, again, similar uh, to uh, what happened before, here, like when the application server uh, wants to commit, it will send this commit request to one of the nodes. And in the terminology of Paxos, this node will be called a proposer. Uh, essentially, it's the same, sorry, same as coordinator uh, in the uh, two-phase commit protocol. It just is a different name, right? But same thing. And then all the participants in the two-phase commit protocol terminology that are participating in this transaction will be called acceptor. Right. So in this case, let's say we have three acceptor because we need a majority or uh, yeah, a majority vote. So here, in the in the uh, I mean, right after uh, this uh, proposer receives this uh, transaction commit request, it will send this uh, proposed request to all the acceptors. Right. So I mean, in the in the in the, in the similar to the um, to this commit scenario. So assuming that one of the acceptor is done. Right, it's like somehow there's a failure on that node. I mean, you lost the connection to it, it doesn't get any response. But if the, all the other two nodes has sent this response called agree message back to the uh, proposer, then, I mean, this consider that there's a majority of the node in my cluster or you know, in my distributed system already has this change, right? Then I can proceed my operation, right? So what's the next step? The next step would be called commit step, right? It's similar to the two-phase commit scenario. And then again, uh, in this case, if the majority of the nodes, I mean, in this, uh, uh, among all my acceptors, 
have sent back that, hey, I can I have already successfully uh, committed these uh, changes, then now this uh, node, uh, this like a proposal node, can send back uh, this uh, application server the success message. All right, and then this uh, Paxos uh, protocol is done. Make sense? Any questions? Okay. So uh, just to illustrate it in a little bit uh, different way. Uh, so, okay, so one thing I need to note here is that uh, <laughs> because, because we, um, in Epexos, right, because we allow the system to commit a transaction without the agreement of all the nodes, right, we only require a majority of the participant or acceptors to agree on this change, and then we can continue. Because of that, we actually need to enforce additional rules on the commitment of the transaction or additional limitations so that we can ensure that uh, all these transactions at the end of the day would resolve in a correct and a consistent state of the entire system. Right? So uh, specifically, we're actually going to use something uh, similar to the uh, timestamp ordering and concurrency control algorithm we talked about earlier. It's not the same thing, right? But we will use something, uh, some notion similar to that. We're actually going to assign a timestamp to these transactions, and then we are going to uh, limit the interactions of these uh, different transactions in this uh, Paxos uh, protocol, so that even though we only need a majority of these uh, nodes to commit, we can still sort of resolve the state of the database correctly, right? So let me illustrate here, right? See here, for example, I have uh, two transactions. I mean, in this case, could would be uh, two proposals, right, in the Paxos terminology. <laughs> And then say that I have a first transaction, a transaction N, I want to make a propose on these three acceptors, right? Again, this timestamp could either be a physical timestamp, a logical timestamp, a counters just keep increasing, doesn't really matter, right? It's like orthogonal to our uh, discussion here. And then say that I have another transaction, right? Uh, oh, that's right, see that, I mean, after that, these acceptors have sent back to the agreement, agree with the proposal back to the proposer, right? And see, now there's another transaction, transaction n plus one comes along, that then I also want to uh, propose, right? And then after that, assume that these acceptors have not decided to accept this proposal yet, right? Maybe doing some calculation, validate whether the uh, transaction has conflict or not. Say right now, if this original proposer, right, proposer n, with proposer with the transaction n, send a commit message uh, to these acceptors, right? Then the restrictions in the Paxos is that if for any acceptor, when if it has seen a uh, any uh, propose from a transaction with a higher timestamp, for example, here a transaction with uh, n plus one that's a higher timestamp, right? It has all the acceptors have received a propose from this kind of a transaction, then this transaction cannot commit, right? So essentially, it has to uh, use this timestamp to ensure this uh, serial order of these transactions uh, to guarantee this, uh, this correct state of the system. And then in this case, because it has um, received a proposal with a transaction that is more recent, it, this, all the acceptors has to reject this commit from this proposer, uh, pro from this proposer right? and then if this, this transaction needs to abort. And then after some time, see that, hey, these acceptors uh, figured out that it can agree with this um, commit proposal of the proposer n plus one, proposer on the right, then uh, they can send the agree message back, and then uh, this proposer can essentially, can finally send the commit message, and then this transaction uh, can commit with this uh, accept message from the acceptors. All right, so this is just a, <laughs> Of course, in the actual Paxos algorithm, is, uh, there are many more implementation details, right? Many more like uh, specific uh, steps to ensure the correctness. But just here, I just want to illustrate to you at a high level uh, what Paxos can achieve and what will be the uh, potential trade-offs here, right? So that's, that's all uh, what we can uh, talk about in this class. That makes sense? Okay. So uh, just continue this, right? <laughs> so obviously, I mean, if we uh, have this restriction that uh, we sort of have to keep a serial order of the proposal of these different transactions, then we potentially will have a lot of abort of the transactions that it doesn't really need to abort, right? Uh, so uh, one obvious way, not obvious way, but, but one potential way to address this issue is that you only allow one, one person to propose, right? So <laughs> essentially that would be a little bit similar to the uh, centralized the transaction coordinator we talked about the last class, right? If you only allow one uh, 
proposer at the time, then, I mean, there's no other proposer that's going to compete at the proposal with you, right? And in fact, essentially, you can also uh, skip the proposal phase as well, because you are the only one that is proposing, right? You only need to try to see whether the acceptors uh, can, uh, can commit or not. And of course, the, um, the uh, straightforward question related to this is that which, which node should, you, should the system decide to be the proposer, right? Or, or in, in, in Paxos terminology, the, the single central proposer would be called leader, right? So the question is, uh, which node should the system decide to be the leader? And in practice, uh, most of the time, uh, just people actually, so not people, system would actually uh, rotate the leader among different nodes. So uh, in the famous uh, spanner system from Google, I think the, um, the, uh, the duration uh, for each uh, leader, I think in their, in their paper they call this a lease, right? So the lease a leader can acquire at a time would only be 10 seconds, right? So every 10 seconds, the system would have a, a sole leader that is responsible to propose all the commit requests. And then after this 10 seconds has finished, then the system would need to propose a new leader, right? And then how do they propose a new leader? Essentially using the same Paxos algorithm, right? So it's a little bit, it's kind of similar to a distributed transaction, right? All the participants or the acceptors need to come together and then decide to reach an agreement on which one should be the single leader and everyone, or at least a majority of them need to accept them. So this leader election algorithm would essentially be a one Paxos protocol. And then if the, what if the leader fails? Well, it's the same thing, right? If the leader fails, during its, its lease, right, during this 10 seconds period, it would essentially, all the participants would do a leader election as well, right, and then select a new leader. Make sense? So that's essentially what, uh, what happened mostly in practice. Okay. So here, just to emphasize the uh, key difference uh, between uh, two-phase commit and Paxos. So uh, in a two-phase commit, we actually need to uh, block the operation if the coordinator fails after the uh, prepare message is already, already sent, right? So uh, essentially, uh, uh, for all the participant, right, it either has to set a timeout uh, to, uh, to uh, abort the transaction if they didn't get this uh, response from the uh, coordinator uh, within a reasonable time, or the participant uh, has to uh, wait forever, right? Wait, wait until the uh, coordinator to recover, right? So that has, may have a potential issue. <laughs> and then in the case of Paxos, it doesn't need to do that, right? So if a leader fails, of course, I mean, you can still set a timestamp, oh, sorry, set a timeout. But then if the timeout also expires, then you don't actually have to abort the transaction or wait for the leader to come back forever, right? You can actually do another round of a leader election as long as there's a majority number of acceptors that are still alive, right? Then you just have a new leader and then you can continue from there. All right, make sense? So uh, another comment I, I want to make is that in, in, in the practical uh, distributed database systems, as far as I know, most systems would actually uh, use uh, two-phase commit, so just because it's, it's simpler, right? And then in the general case, you are not going to assume that uh, the system would fail that often, right? So if, if, the, if, if the participants, or the, I think in two-phase, um, in, in, in Paxos it's called acceptors, if they don't fail that often, right? If there's no, uh, there's a straggler that there's always be uh, uh, super slow than the others, then two-phase commit would be would just be a much simpler uh, protocol, right? But then if, if for, for whatever reason, your operating environment uh, would contain uh, frequent failures, then you may consider a protocol like Paxos, right? Okay? Okay. All right, any question about two-phase commit and Paxos before we move to replication? Okay, nice. <laughs> so uh, replication, like I said, uh, most of the database system, actually, not, I shouldn't say it this way. So many people that uh, use a data distributed database system, I mean, would actually uh, not only want the property of the database system that you can, I mean, store more data beyond a single node, but the most users of the database system also wants the uh, property of a distributed data system that can have replication or replica, replicates of the data, right? So uh, if, uh, for example, you, you uh, deploy a distributed data system, a distributed database system on uh, different data centers, say uh, in different uh, states, I mean in the US or even different continents, then if one data center is down, 
you, you still have your data available in a different data center, data center, right? Then you can actually uh, make sure that your uh, normal application is still serving your customer. It's like you don't have, have a downtime of, a, of your website, doesn't impact your business, right? So that's actually a very, very important reason uh, why people use a distributed database system in practice. And then uh, we are going to talk about a few uh, specific design decisions related to this uh, replication of functionality, right? Okay. So the uh, first would be uh, would be the configuration uh, uh, strategy you use to replicate your data. So at a high level, there are two strategies to uh, make data copies in a distributed database system. The first one would call the primary replica strategy. And actually, I don't know what's it called in the textbook, but um, previously, or if you search the material online, oftentimes it's actually called a master-slave strategy. But because you know the master-slave could have uh, other meanings, right? Other interpretations. Uh, so in general, we actually now nowadays we prefer this terminology of um, primary and replica. <laughs> so uh, in this uh, first uh, 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 first configuration strategy of a replica in distributed database system. All the updates will actually go through a designated um, primary in your entire uh, distributed database system, right? So uh, essentially, all the replicas is only responsible for receiving the updates in the primary, but then all the writes are going to this uh, single node. And then this after, I mean, the primary finish, I mean, making the changes uh, according to the writes, write request of your queries, then it will just uh, propagate all the update, uh, uh, propagate propagates all the updates to all the replicas, actually it doesn't need an atomic commit protocol either, right? Because it's different than this, um, it's a two-phase commit protocol that we talked about earlier. In the, when, we're, when we're thinking about this replication, especially in a primary replica configuration for the replication, the primary would be the single source of truth of the data, right? So whenever there's a crash, you come back, you would always look back into this primary node to say, hey, to see, hey, what is the, the content of the data in my primary node? And that would be the true source of data. And then you don't need to run this uh, two-phase commit protocol when you're trying to propagate data from primary to the replicas, all right? And then uh, you, uh, it depends on your uh, consistency level, but then the system could also allow read-only uh, transactions to be executed on the replicas to increase the bandwidth of the system. But of course, as you can imagine, if, uh, if there's a read-only transaction on the replica, but then the changes from the primary has not propagated to the replica, then there will be a small time window there. there may be uh, inconsistent data, right? And depending on the, uh, the acid level or the consistency level of the system of, of, your of your application, you may or you may not want that to happen, right? So that depends, but then it's, a, it's an optional thing that you could do to execute read-only transactions on the replica to increase the throughput of the system, all right? And then uh, lastly, right, if the primary goes down, then you essentially do a leader election on all the replicas to elect a new primary, right, using either a Paxos or Raft. Make sense? Okay. <laughs> then on contrary, so what would be, actually, I think the uh, most system would actually, I think it's just something that you could choose, but I think the primary replica is more common based on as far as I know. But then, I mean, in the country, a alternative strategy would be called uh, multi-primary. You essentially, um, every replica, each replica node uh, of the data would be a primary as well, right? There's no difference between a replica and a primary. And then all the writes can go to all the node on, on any replica, right? And any replica would, would serve as a primary, essentially. And of course, when transactions want to commit, you have to resolve the potential conflict between uh, different replicas as well, all right? And uh, you can imagine there will be additional overhead uh, related to that. So <laughs> again, um, the, the primary replica approach would be the more common approach. And in fact, in actuality, right, as far, again, as far as I know, most of the uh, users of distributed database system would actually just only use this uh, primary replica uh, setup without even partitioning the data, right? Because uh, of course, if you uh, work for uh, Google or uh, like Facebook, then they have uh, lots of lots of data you actually need to uh, partition on uh, different machines, right? And then to manage them uh, uh, collectively. But then in practice, let's say more, uh, almost more than 90% of the user of the heavy system, they don't necessarily have so much data that they, they just can't fit on a single machine, right? And in that, in that scenario, the, uh, the biggest reason that they use 
a distributed database system is actually the availability reason, right? You actually can put your data among uh, different uh, machines so that one machine in one data center is down, you can still have uh, machines in other data centers that are running, you can elect a new primary, and then doesn't impact your normal business operation, and you can still serve your customer, right? So in actuality, in, in, in almost as far as far I know, in, in most cases, this would actually be um, would, would actually be sufficient uh, for the user's requirement or the need to use a distributed database system. But of course, if you work for a giant company, then uh, maybe they, they also then, then they, in many cases they would need to actually partition the data. All right. So to use this, right, in a primary replica scenario, you would obviously have one primary and then potentially uh, one or two or many uh, replicas. And then all the writes, I mean, including the reads, but especially all the writes will go to the primary, right? And then after the primary applies all the writes, and then they can it, it can propagate these uh, changes of the writes uh, to these replicas. And for the replicas, it only executes the reads, all right? That's the primary replica setup. And in the multi-primary uh, uh, multi setup or configuration, all the nodes are both uh, replica and primary, right? So all the read and the writes can uh, go to uh, each all of those nodes. And of course, if when there's conflict, you have to do a coordination between uh, different copies of replicas, which can have additional overhead. All right? Okay. So another related concept uh, with this uh, replication in distributed database system would actually call the K uh, safety. So essentially a K safety uh, or the number K would just represents the uh, minimum number of data copies that have to exist in the distributed database system, right? So let's say if a K is three, which would actually be the most common value in practice, then for every single record, Right, in your database system, it needs to exist on at least three machines, right? Could be like one primary, two replicas, for example, right? And if, I mean, for some reason, I mean, there's some machine failed, the number of copies for any record in your distributed database go below three, uh, then you either have to immediately stop the database system and report an error, right, let somebody to fix it, or in some system, you could automatically uh, create a new machine or spawn up a new machine and then uh, create a new copies of the data to make sure that every record has lead uh, this um, K number of copies and then you can continue, right? So that's kind of like a uh, availability uh, guarantee that the system provides to the users and this uh, called K safety, all right? This is also like a common concept that people may use and then uh, specify to the system uh, when they uh, use distri distributed databases. So now, the next topic, how do the system uh, propagate all the changes? So uh, again, I, I, I sort of mentioned this uh, or discussed this a little bit last class when we were talking about um, this, uh, this consistent, hash, consistent hashing. Right, we talk about this ring of hash values and where you just uh, locate a uh, value of a of locate the value the hash value of a key in a ring and then look ahead to see uh, what would be the uh, machines that you need to put the record of this data to right and we said that you can just look ahead a few records if you want to have a uh, if you want the data to be replicated um, uh, on, on a few machines so uh, essentially here the uh, the formal I mean, definition of the propagation scheme is that whether um, when you are trying to, uh, I mean, replicate the data, right? Whether you have to wait for all the copies of the data to be successfully written, right? To have the uh, latest update the, the, of this uh, value of this uh, record, you, whether you need to require that to happen before you get back to the client, right? And see that, hey, I have successfully written this data. And if, say, you have to require that all the uh, replicas of this data have successfully applied these changes and written to the disk and been before you get back to the client that, hey, this record has successfully been modified in your database system, then that will be called strong consistency, right? Whenever there's a new transaction come along and no matter which replica, which node, the new transaction is going to read the data, it's going to read the same copy, right? It's always going to be consistent. It's called strong consistency. And then using the terminology of uh, replications, propagation scheme, it will be called synchronous replication, right? And we'll see why it's called synchronous uh, with the examples uh, later. And then on the other hand, right? If we say that, hey, we actually don't need the change 
to be uh, propagated on every single replica before we go back to the client at, uh, and tell the client that, hey, I have successfully made and committed these this changes, then that will be called a eventual consistency. And obviously, it's a less consistent state compared to strong consistency, right? Because if a new transaction come along and then it reads a uh, data, read, read, the, read the value of the data on a replica that has not been propagated with the recent changes, then this value could be outdated, right? It's not very consistent. So it's called eventual consistency. And then using the terminology of a replication scheme or replication or propagation scheme uh, in distributed database dev system, it will be called asynchronous replication. All right, like this. So go into a bit details, right? <laughs> So first of all, uh, with the synchronous replication, so what will be required here is that in this uh, scenario, the primary is going to be responsible to send all its updates to the replicas and then wait for them to fully apply all the updates. It's, it, in most cases, that would just mean that the log records is flushed to the disk. And then before that, it can send back to the application and then uh, say that, hey, uh, this change has successfully been uh, applied. So I'll give you this example here, right? <laughs> say uh, this, uh, this is a, the first node is a primary, right? I, I, I did, did not write here, but say the first node is a primary, and then the application wants to commit, and then the primary, before it commits, before it sends commits back to the application, it needs to send these uh, changes uh, up to this uh, replica, right? And then it's, in most cases, it needs to uh, wait for the uh, replica to flush uh, this record on, on, the, on the disk, right? If the replica is using a right head login with the errors then it needs to wait and wait and wait, and then only after the replica has successfully I mean, written uh, these uh, changes back to the disk in the log records, then it can send the knowledge uh, to the primary, and the primary can send back to the application that this change has been successfully committed. All right? And then, I mean, again, as you can tell, any read on the replica would be consistent, right? It's exactly the same value as you would read on the primary. And then in this another scenario, in the in the asynchronous case, right? Then the primary could actually immediately uh, return to the uh, to the application once uh, it sends the uh, data to the replica, but doesn't need to uh, wait for the replica to flush the records, right? <laughs> Again, similar here. If there's a commit request from the client or the application server, then while this uh, primary sends the uh, flush request to the uh, replica, it can immediately send the acknowledge back. And then in this uh, in this scenario. Uh, this uh, this replica can try to flush it uh, at at the time it it it, it, it determines prop, uh, proper right and then uh, this uh, uh, eventually this uh, this change would uh, propagate to the replica assume that the replica didn't fail so that's why it's called eventual consistency all right okay so uh, the uh, next strategy, right? So there are actually quite a few strategies related to the replication. So the next strategy uh, that we need to decide will be called uh, propagation uh, timing, right? So uh, in this scenario, um, oh, by the way, one comment I, I need to make for this propagation scheme is that typically, right, typically the system would actually support both, right? So unlike some other scenarios, uh, many, many times, oftentimes the system just choose one scenario strategy to apply. Uh, typically, uh, the distributed system, distributed database system, will actually expose this as an option, right? Because it's actually not that difficult to support both, right? You just, you just uh, in the in your algorithm, you just say whether I'm waiting or not. So uh, the system will actually support both, and then it would expose the option to the application, right? Depending on the requirement and the property of the application, the developers uh, or the application would, could actually decide whether it needs a uh, synchronous or asynchronous uh, replication uh, uh, strategy and then, uh, I mean, to handle its logic. All right, an additional comment, okay? So the uh, next strategy that we need to decide when we talk about replication would be called, when, when would be the time that you uh, perform such propagation of log records, right? So it's also kind of straightforward. At high level, there are just uh, two uh, types of, uh, two, two timing, two different, uh, different approaches to, uh, uh, to handle this. The first would be called continuous, right? Essentially, Every time the transaction uh, applies some change to uh, this primary, right, with a query, then the primary can decide to immediately send this change to the replica, no matter whether this transaction is committing or not, right? And then uh, on the replica, the replica can just uh, keep applying those changes incrementally, right? And then when the transaction is going to commit or abort, the primary can just send a commit and abort 
message uh, to the replica, and then the replica can either decide to finally commit the change or just roll back or undo all the changes uh, from early, right? So uh, the obvious advantage is the, of this approach is that the replica is continuously applying changes, right? It's not trying to uh, wait all the, all the updates to arrive at the end and then uh, do a huge write which could potentially uh, cause loss of time. But then the disadvantage of this is that if the transaction abort, then all the uh, changes you have applied earlier would actually be wasteful, right? Because you have to roll back everything. So on the immediate contrary, the other approach uh, people would use in this case would be uncommit uh, propagation, right? So in this scenario, you have the primary actually don't send any log messages uh, to the um, replica until the transaction is either going to commit or abort, right? So if the transaction decides to com commit, it would finally, I mean, batch up all the uh, changes or all the log records of this transaction along with the commit message to the replica, for the replica to apply them all together. Uh, it, it will be a sequential write in the log records, but this um, log record can potentially be large, right? And it, it also needs to fit into the memory as well. Otherwise, it's difficult to send that to the replica. Uh, but then the advantage of this uncommit approach would be that, um, well, kind of obvious as well, you don't actually need to send anything if the transaction is aborted, right? Because you never send any updates to the replica before the transaction abort, and once the transaction abort, you only need to roll back all the changes on the primary, and then nothing in the replica is affected, right? So there's just a trade-off between two different approaches. Make sense? Okay. So the uh, last strategy uh, we need to talk about uh, here, uh, actually uh, this strategy, most, most of the time people use the second one, right? But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's the last strategy that's related to this um, replication uh, uh, in a distributed heavy system is that whether you use a um, active-active or active-passive um, uh, strategy to apply changes. So this is actually uh, different from uh, the uh, primary replica versus a primary, a pri a primary, a multi-primary we talked about earlier. So in this case, for example, in a active active strategy, right? So what you will do is that instead of uh, having one a specific node to uh, make all the changes from the transactions or the queries and then propagate those changes later, in an active active strategy, what you will do is that assuming the um, data has three copies right, on three replica, on three replicas, in this strategy you will actually send the queries with uh, with three copies to each of these uh, replica, right? So on each of the replica, you actually get the exact copy of this query. And then you actually execute that query on each of these replica, instead of uh, making change on replica and then merging changes over, right? So the advantage of this is that you potentially uh, send less data, right? But then the challenge of this is that hey, what if there are other transactions executing on these replicas, right? There are interleaving between different transactions. How do we resolve this, right? So this is actually very infrequently used. I mean, uh, occasionally, right? I think there are one or two systems use this, but uh, it's very rare, right? But it's, it's one choice you can have. And then the other active-passive strategy, which would be uh, more similar to the example we talked about earlier, right? If you have one primary, a few replicas, you would only execute the query from that transaction on the primary, and then you would just, just look at what would be the changes, or in other words, the log records generated by that transaction or query, right? And then you only send the changes after the query execution to the replicas and apply them there. And then you don't have to uh, deal with the scenario where you are executing these queries, the same queries on different replicas, and if other things interleave with them, how to resolve the conflicts, etc. All right, make sense? So most of the system would use the active-passive approach. It's just much simpler. Okay. So in the next 15 or so minutes, we talk about cap theorem as well as uh, uh, federated database. So uh, this is actually uh, a very, um, we, we talk about lots of strategies, right? Lots of properties, et cetera, with, um, with a distributed database. But then there's this one theorem that kind of summarizes what kind of properties a distributed database system can provide and what it cannot provide uh, very succinctly called a uh, cap theorem. And it's actually uh, invented by a, a professor from UC Berkeley called Eric Brewer. I think he's also one of the um, very first uh, engineer, very, very first engineer in Google, right? but, but uh, later on he, he teach in, in Berkeley. And then uh, essentially he come up with this theorem and, and prove it right, formally that 
in a distributed data system, you can actually you can, you, 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 you can't really have um, all these uh, three uh, different properties at the same time, namely uh, consistent, uh, available, always available, as well as network partition tolerant. And we'll, we'll go into the details about these uh, properties uh, soon, right? So uh, essentially what you can do is that at best, you can, your distributed database can pick two of these properties and then provide that functionality to the users. And um, when I say I mean, pick, pick two here and sort of, it means that it's not that every combination, or every two combination of these three properties would be, actually be possible, right? So even though um, you cannot, you, you, you can pick two uh, properties, you, you, you will never be able to uh, satisfy three properties uh, altogether, there could also be some combinations, or I think it's like the combination of a consistency and always available, that specific combination of, pro of, of only two property is not really possible either, right? Uh, but uh, you, cannot, you can never achieve um, three properties at the same time, okay? So uh, to illustrate this, right, uh, this uh, C represents consistency, A represents availability, and P represents uh, uh, partition or tolerant then the consistency would be uh, similar to the uh, linearizability concept we talk about in a database, right? You want to guarantee that, hey, at the end of the day, the state of the database would be equivalent to some serial execution, serial order execution of uh, a scheduling of the transactions, right? And then you want the state of the database to, to be consistent and records, all the records would be in the correct state. And then availability would mean that all the nodes that are up or available would actually be uh, be able to accept the request, right? So in other words, availability means that as long as a, a node is live, it should um, be available to provide a service. It should be able to uh, answer re request and back uh, back to the clients, right? That would just means uh, availability. And then the lastly, the network uh, partition or partition tolerant property would mean that the system would still be able to operate even though there's a network failure and then some nodes in the database in your know, distributed system cannot communicate with some other nodes, right? And in that case, if the system is still be able to operate, then we would say, we would say that the system is uh, network partition tolerant, all right? And then uh, what would be impossible would just be the, uh, the overlap of all the three, right? It's impossible to satisfy all the three properties together. Any questions about these definitions of the three properties before we, yes? What's the difference between linearizability as a type of consistency and serializability as a type of isolation? Linearizability. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah, you, so the question is what would be the difference between linearizability and serializability? So uh, linearizability is a, it's okay, so at high levels they are similar. Right, so the intuition of them are very similar. Uh, and uh, if you just only want to understand the high level concept of cap theorem, you can view them as the same, right? But then in different, in, in, specifically, linearizability is a concept developed in a distributed system world, and serializability is a concept developed from the database community, right? So specifically, they have a small differences in their definition, and linearability, the, the linearizability here which actually means that a set of um, operations, sorry, a set of transactions, right, would be executed, would, would, well, the scheduling of a set of transactions would have a result that would be equivalent to a uh, specific serial order uh, of this, uh, this transaction. So the order is kind of determined, right, called linearizability. And then in the serializability, uh, in the database community, uh, the definition would be that as long as the execution uh, of this set of transactions will be equivalent to some serial order right, of this scheduling, then I would consider it serializable. It doesn't need to follow a specific order. Right? So it's at a high level of the difference, but um, uh, intuitively they are very similar. Right? Yeah. Essentially they want to make sure that the system, whether it's a distributed system or distri whether it's a yeah, distributed operating system or database system, it needs to be in a correct state. Right? Yes. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, please. Oh, so sorry, could, could, could you say it again? Um, like, how tolerant is partition tolerant? Like, uh, I presume the database would not work correctly if every node isolates every other node, right? Like, what's yeah. the limit on that? Yes, yeah, so uh, I'm not sure why you exactly get your question, but essentially, the, I think the question is how tolerant partition tolerant needs to be, but essentially it just means that 
if there's a network partition, right? Uh, the, uh, if there's a subset of nodes in your system cannot communicate with some other subsets at all, right? Just a, essentially there's a partition, there's a wall between two subsets of the node, then the system can still operate, right? Either one subset operate, the other operate, or both operate, but the system can still, uh, can still work assuming that you, assuming there are no other failures, right? So that just means a network tolerant. Okay, okay, yeah. Okay, so here let me give you a uh, some uh, industry example, right? So uh, here we have um, this, uh, I mean, uh, two uh, two application servers, right, sending sending requests, and assume that we have uh, two nodes in the database system, right? And then there's a uh, network in between, and assume that at the beginning of this example, the network is is successful, right? It's like a good network, and everyone can communicate with each other. And then I have a primary node and a replica node. So see here. The application have uh, this uh, send this uh, first request to set record a equals to two, and then I mean successfully finish right, and then uh, this uh, this I mean when the network I mean is like always called them um, operates uh, normally, then this primary node can send these um, changes to the replica node right, and then replica would have this uh, the other uh, the value of the other record as well right, and if assuming that we have the we have a uh, synchronous uh, replication scheme strategy, then in this case, the system would be consistent, right? Because you would immediately propagate change to the replica. And then after that, the uh, primary can send the, uh, this, um, this acknowledgement back to the application server and see that, hey, this change has been successfully uh, applied, right? And then now, if the other node come, come along and then try to read this record, it will immediately see this value two uh, from this node, right? So uh, essentially, uh, if the primary sees the transaction has committed, then it should be, it should be immediately be available to all the other replicas. And then that will be considered a consistent uh, state. All right, we sort of talked about this in the uh, synchronous replication earlier. Make sense? Okay. So now, availability, what does this mean? It, so what, what availability mean, mean is that Say again, same example, right? Two nodes, primary replica had two application server, and then assuming that one node is down now, right? Like this, uh, this node B, or replica B is down. <laughs> Sorry, replica is down. Then now, what happened is that for the first application, when it's trying to read uh, record B, I mean, it's, it's the same, uh, same read path, right? It can still come through uh, this primary and then get the result back, right? B equals to eight. And then when the other application server trying to um, read the data, then originally it may be, maybe the replica, the replica is closer to the other application, so usually it would just go to the replica. But now, if the replica is done, as long as there's some other node in your system is still alive, right? They, they need to be able to serve this read uh, from the others, from the application as well. In this case, the application will just uh, go to the primary and then read this record and then get this uh, value back, right? So this would uh, satisfy the availability uh, requirement. All right? So uh, lastly, uh, partition tolerance, right? So again, same example, primary replica, and then assume that for some reason, <laughs> there is a, uh, there is a uh, network failure. Right, and then there's just become this partition, between, become, become this uh, hard wall between, wall between these uh, two nodes, and these two nodes cannot communicate with each other anymore, right? So right now, if we uh, want to um, make this uh, database to uh, keep operate, which would satisfy network uh, partition tolerance, we will need to have at least uh, one node to be uh, still operating, right? But then, at the meantime, because in this, in this case, nobody would actually know uh, the, the other node, the, the two nodes cannot talk to each other anymore, right? So no, not a single node will know whether the other node is still operating or not. So in this case, if we want to guarantee availability, right, we need to, we need to make sure that as long as if some node is still up, it, it still needs to be able to answer requests from the clients, right? So in this case, I mean, the replica B, if it still wants to satisfy availability to answer requests, but it doesn't know whether it, 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 the other primary is, is dead or not. So what it needs to do here, when it lost connection to the primary, it needs to do a, a, reader, a leader election, right? But assuming that there's only one node here, it will just elect itself to be the leader. So right now, there will be two primary coexist in the, in the database system if you want to satisfy a network partition tolerance as well as availability at the same time. And in this, case, in this case, what will happen? What will happen is that, assume that there are two different applications send different records, one set A equals two, the other set equals two three, and then they will update this, uh, 
two primaries at the meantime, and then send back the acknowledgement. And then we, if at some point later, when the network comes back, then the two systems would actually become in an inconsistent state, right? So, I mean, right now you have to, well, the, 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 the state of the system is already inconsistent, inconsistent but some system uh, may allow that, and then you resolve that later. But in some system, uh, if you want strong consistency, then you need to either satisfy, sorry, either sacrifice um, network partitioning or sacrifice uh, the higher availability. All right, make sense? Any questions on this example? Okay, nice. So uh, just a little bit of comment on this um, on this uh, cap theorem. In uh, different, uh, of course, a different database system would actually uh, choose different combinations of property uh, in terms of this um, CAP uh, theorem. And usually, the uh, traditional uh, relational database systems, as as the uh, so-called new CQ, which would be the uh, in-memory relational database system, they would usually uh, choose um, uh, this uh, what's it called. <laughs> Consistency or the other properties, uh, say uh, this um, availability or network tolerance, as right? so we want to make sure that the, the database system is always consistent. And if there's a network partition, right, for example, then it needs to, for example, it may just uh, directly, in the earlier example, it may just directly fail the uh, replica instead of trying to let the replica read, read like itself, right, so that uh, the database system can guarantee the consistent property. But in some other uh, NoSQL system, right, for example, Cassandra, right, then they will prefer uh, this um, network tolerance as well as availability over uh, consistency. So essentially, uh, in some of these system, um, if a network partition, they will allow everyone to continue, right, try to serve their users as much as possible. And then back to the earlier example, if such a case exists, right, if Sometime later, the network resume, and then there will be inconsistent state. Then they will try to resolve the records later, right? But note that no matter how the system resolves the record, it's already inconsistent, right? Because if some other transactions were reading these records in between and do some operations based on these uh, values of these records already, then it's already inconsistent, right? But I mean, depending on the requirement of the application, some system would actually allow this. All right? Okay. Okay, so uh, the uh, last topic, federated database in the last like uh, three or four minutes. So uh, essentially what we talked about so far is that a, a, the, the, in a distributed database system, right? So you will actually have a centralized uh, architecture that would have a total control of every single node in your database system, right? And then you will have a, a centralized view to make all the decisions, determine all the strategies, replication, uh, synchronous, asynchronous, etc. But in many of the applications in practice, people actually need to uh, use different database system software for different uh, purposes of their application, right? For example, in, in, in your bank, uh, it may have lots of different database systems, like say Postgres, MySQL, or even sometimes Amazon Redshift, that are just used for different purposes in their, in their organization, right? For very different workloads. But then at some point, uh, people may need to uh, you have may need to issue queries that record access records and uh, and access result from this different set of databases at the meantime and maybe uh, aggregate some information and perform some data analytics for example right so in this case I mean, of course one uh, naive way would just be that you handle that in the application level right so uh, for this uh, different system uh, you um, yeah essentially uh, you you could actually for your application, you could write queries to the different system, and then different system can I mean, send back their results separately, and then you resolve that later, right? So you can do that, but then it would actually be nice that if there is a single interface that handles all those for you, right? Essentially hide the different database system software, the implementations of different system altogether in a centralized I mean, software or interface so that the application can directly write queries to that single interface as if it's a giant distributed database, right? That would actually be nice, right? So that's essentially the idea of a federated database system. And then uh, uh, essentially, just like I described, it, it's, a, it's a sort of a, like a middleware almost, right? or a co coordinator that would uh, make different database system software to uh, collaborate with each other and so that the users would view it as if it's a single distributed database system. And of course, it's actually a pretty difficult, right? Because, you know, different database system may have a different data models, different languages, and if the query is difficult, then you actually need to have a 
centralized optimizer that is optimized, that are going to optimize the query execution and coordinate them on different database systems, right? And then uh, you would, oftentimes you actually need to copy the data out of this different system to the centralized coordinator and then do processing as well. But then it's just a, a convenient uh, functionality that is like a make users' lives easier. All right, so just give you a simple reason for this, right? Say you have a bank or whatever, have a few backend database system all together, right? MySQL, MongoDB, um, Redis, etc. And then through this uh, middleware, or in other words, a federated database, when users issue a request to this system, it can actually uh, send the different queries um, to this um, separate systems uh, separately, right? And then usually this communication channel between your middleware to this uh, individual database system would call the connectors, right? And then after the, the middleware receives all response, it needs to do the post-processing to get back to the results of the application server, right? Again, that would just be called a federated database. And then one interesting example of this is actually a Postgres. So this is always Postgres database, right? It's not a middleware. But Postgres actually sort of provides you the functionality to serve as a federated database with a uh, interface called foreign data wrapper. Right? It's kind of interesting. So even though Postgres has its own functionality to store and process data, execute queries, etc., it actually provides you this interface to hook up to just sort of a fake, a like a customized table with a external database, right? So you can define a table using foreign data wrapper in Postgres, and which is actually backed up by a different database system. And then you can actually, within the Postgres uh, architecture, you can try to do optimizations on the queries across different tables with different databases and then send back a user a single result. Right? So that's actually one way to achieve this um, federated database with the Postgres. It's kind of cool. All right. So that's pretty much what we uh, want to talk about today. Just to uh, summarize the uh, key, uh, key property here and all the things we talk about in this class, right, with the distributed uh, concurrency control, distributed transaction, is that we actually assume that um, this, all the nodes in the database would behave friendly, right? All of them we have a full control. If some of the node may behave maliciously, it will be a different scenario, and you would use um, Byzantine failure toler tolerant protocol, and then blockchain would be uh, one example of this. And then uh, there's also this uh, tool. Uh, developed by a, uh, this famous tool developed by a person called Kyle Kinsbury. He actually has this uh, Jepson project where he actually bunch, has a bunch of customized workloads uh, that he um, just try to issue this uh, corner case in some cases, right? Try to issue this very, very difficult distributed uh, transactions to your system to test that whether your system actually uh, satisfies consistency or not, right? Whether your system actually satisfies one or a few uh, properties, for example, from the CAP theorem. And um, it started as a side project, but eventually uh, this tool is actually became really, really good. Nowadays, many uh, like an industrial standard uh, mature distributed database would actually just use this tool to test whether it, it is actually implementing things correctly or not, because it's very difficult to implement the distributed transaction correctly. And then, so if you encounter that, if you want to test your own system, you may also check out this tool as well. Okay, that's all for today uh, for uh, OLTP uh, distributed database. And for our next class, we're gonna talk about uh, analytical queries in uh, distributed database systems. All right, see you next Monday. Talking about the St. Ives brew, run through a can or two. Share with my crew is magnificent. Plus it's mellow. And for the rest of the commercial, I pass the mic on to my no fellow. Need for a mic check, plus it. The bees are set to grab a 40. The put him to yoga, snap his neck. St. Ives. Take a sip, then wipe your lips. Cue my 40's getting warm. I'm out, he got some dip. Drink it, drink it, drink it, then I burp. After I slurp, ice cube, I put in much work. With the BMT and the E-Trouble, get us a St. Ives brew on the double.